in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The first sermon that was ever preached by the church is recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. Peter was preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and while he was in the middle of his sermon, we're told that the crowd interrupted him. They shouted out, what shall we do? Truth is most often met by questions. It's not because we don't believe, but it's because we don't understand. And often we aren't sure what we are supposed to do. The night of Jesus' arrest that we've been talking, and talking about and studying for months was filled with Jesus declaring truth and the apostles asking questions. Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Where are you going? Why can I not follow you now? We do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And then there was the question that was framed as a statement when Philip said, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Judas then asked, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? The night was filled with questions and Jesus was filled with more than answers. He was filled with compassion, with patience, and with a commitment to giving them the truth that their hearts and their faith would require. You know, questions weren't anything new for Jesus. He'd been facing questions his entire ministry, really his entire life. The first time we're introduced to Jesus beyond his birth is when he was 12 years old, when he had stayed at the temple after his parents, Joseph and Mary, had began their journey back to Nazareth. And when they were along the way, they discovered Jesus wasn't with them. And so, in a panic, as all of you parents can feel and identify with, they go back toward Jerusalem to see if they can find Jesus. And when they found him in the temple, Mary immediately asked him, how, why have you treated us like this? When Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus immediately asked, how can a man be born when he is old? When he told the crowd to do the work of God in John 6, they said, what must we do? I'm sure you get the point. God speaks truth, we ask questions. Now, please don't think that this sermon is going to be about asking fewer questions. Mm -hmm. Questions are good. They are healthy. They are necessary. No one learns without asking questions about what they don't know, what they don't understand, even what they don't like or what they don't agree with. You can't learn what you haven't been taught. Right. And questions are one of the most important parts, not just of learning, but of teaching. God is our Father, Jesus is our example, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Godhead expects, and I believe he, they, he even enjoys our questions. This morning we're going to attempt to ask, and then I pray allow the Scripture to answer a very important question. Jesus said that He is the true vine. Everything that grows, grows from Him, and because of Him, and also for Him. The Father is the vine dresser. He does all the work, He gives all the effort. He protects the vine, He gathers the fruit, He prunes the branches, and makes them able, not just to bear fruit, but then to bear more fruit. Today we finally touch verse 5. We are the branches. And as branches, we have been given one very simple command. Jesus said, abide in me, and he will keep saying it. Twelve times he uses the word abide in the first 17 verses of the chapter. Last week we talked about what abiding is. It's staying and dwelling. It's living in the place of relationship. Today we have to ask the question, how do we abide? Which, like most good questions, doesn't really lead to an answer. It creates more questions. What does abiding look like? What does it mean? How do we do it? 
Most of us want to be like Christ. We're here because we want to be fruitful. Some of us have been fruitful and we even want to be more fruitful. But what I pray we realize today is that being branches is not about our effort for Jesus. It is about our trust in Jesus. It's not about what we do in his name. It's about what his name means to us. It's not about how much we understand. It's about how willing we are to believe. And so we will start with the questions, and I pray that we will hear the Scripture and the Spirit begin leading us to answers that teach us to abide. Jesus said, abide in me. And I think for many of us, our first reaction is simply to ask, how do we do that? See, there's something in us that wants to do the right thing. We want to check off the box. In fact, a lot of our anxiety is just fear over not doing the right thing, not knowing what, that we've done the right thing. How many of us have at some point prayed to God, afraid that maybe we don't belong to Him? Maybe we haven't done the right thing. Maybe we didn't pray the right prayer. We spend so much of our energy trying to answer a question that Christ has already answered for us. And so our desire to be right leads us to ask questions. We strongly believe in cause and effect, that if we do the right thing for God, then God will do the right thing for us. Just yesterday at the men's uh, study over at Tabernacle, um, one of my friends there shared something that he has shared many times, but yesterday it struck me almost, uh, almost brand new. He said one of the songs that he really struggles with that they sing at church regularly is, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. It's cause and effect. It's a transaction then. That means I praise him to get from him, not because of what he's already done for me. Sometimes we don't think about what we're saying. We just say things that make sense to us until we examine them and say, wait, that can't possibly be. Because if I'm praising him because I need something else from him, I have already forgotten what he's already done for me. We're, we're, too, we're too involved in the cause and effect. This is why we wonder what we did wrong when we face trouble and difficulty and why we expect to have smooth sailing when we know we're doing what God wants us to do. As we talked about last week, abiding is about relationship. It is a response to who God is, not an effort to get what we want. Abiding is not about our emptiness, but God's fullness. It's not what we do for God, but how we receive what God has done for us. In John chapter 6, which we talk about often, Jesus told the crowd that, that had just the night before eaten the miraculous meal multiplied from five loaves and two fish, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus' point was that we spend the better part of our lives working hard to accomplish things that don't last, that can't satisfy, but even more for things that he has already promised to provide if we will just trust him. So often the things that God has already said he'll take care of, we spend a lot of time pleading with him to take care of them. So often the things that God has already said are in his control, we spend a lot of tears wondering and fearing that maybe he won't control those things at all. And so when Jesus tells that crowd, stop working for the things that, that perish, what he's saying is, stop doing my job and trust that I will do it. And I will do it well. We have to work. We need jobs. Food is a necessity, as is shelter, clothing, health care, transportation. The list seems to just get bigger with each year that passes of the things that we have to have. And so this isn't a call to stop working. It was a call not to sit back and do nothing. It was a reminder that God has promised to take care of our needs. And it was a reminder he always has. So he always will. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The beauty of this is that it's not just a command. Jesus didn't just say, Don't worry and then move on to the next part of the sermon. He was not giving orders. He was changing perspective. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, what we need is not a command to obey, but a perspective that we haven't seen or we haven't trusted in yet. Most of us, and I'm, I put myself at the top of the list, are still living in this low perspective of God rather than seeing him as the high and lofty one that he truly is. We're looking up at him rather than being seated with him in heavenly places and seeing that he really is leading and guiding and he really is providing and protecting even when I can't see it. 
I recently read this illustration or this analogy and it made so much sense to me that God is weaving a tapestry. The problem is most of us are living under it. So all we see is the mess of the knots and the, and, and, and the, and the cloth and the, excuse me, the thread as it's being wound. But if we would sit with him as Ephesians calls us to, what we would be doing is looking down at the beauty that he's designing rather than the hidden parts that we could never understand. We need a change in our perspective. And so often what Jesus is doing in Scripture is changing what we see and even how we view Him. And so Jesus doesn't just say, don't worry. He says, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? It's not just if God feeds the birds, won't He feed you? It's do you understand how valuable God calls you? Do you understand the worth that he has placed upon you? See, worry reveals that we don't know where we stand with God. That's ultimately what worry is. Because if we know where we stand with God, we know that he will feed us, he will clothe us, he will give us jobs that take care of what needs to. He will hold us in difficulty, he will surround us when enemies come. If we really know where we stand with him, our worries get answered by our standing. And so when we give in to worry, it's because we are questioning our standing. I have people tell me regularly, some of you have told me, I'm just a worrier, I can't help it. I've been there. I still fight that myself. Anxiety seems to be my fallback position. But forgive me today, none of the things we say about worry are true. Mm -hmm. You are not a worrier. You've chosen worry. You can help it. You're choosing it. I know it because when I give in to it, it's my choice. It's not my design. Mm -hmm. We were not made to worry. We have been conditioned to worry. Worry is not how God formed us, it's how the world has changed us. Worry is not how God, what God creates, it's what the devil uses. Worry is not true, it's always a lie. Because it's not so much the thing we're worrying about. Worry tells us that we're not valuable enough to be protected. It tells us that we don't matter enough to be watched over, walked with, or provided for. If you battle with worry, I encourage you today, learn what God says about your value to Him. Because that is our tool against worry. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples for ministry without him for the first time. He told them how to go, what to take, and what to do. And then he warned them that it would not be easy and there would be danger. But he said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. He didn't say, don't be afraid, you won't be killed. (laughs) He said, don't fear those who kill the body. See, while this was a specific event for a specific people at a specific time, I believe that it teaches us a great principle for all of our lives for all of time. If we are in Christ, then he is in us and he is with us. But he is also leading and guiding us. He makes a way, not where there is no way. He makes a way where he wants us to be. Mm. He makes us a way, not where we thought we should be, but where he actually wants us to be. Being where he puts you is where you belong. Not where you always thought you would be or where you feel where you are the most useful or even the most wanted. God has specific places and specific people he wants us to go and to meet. He has specific tasks that he designs and he desires for us. He provides and he protects, but there is danger. In Romans chapter 8, verse 36, Paul wrote, We face death all day long. That wasn't just Paul's experience. That was him, the Holy Spirit, preparing all of us for what it's like to live in a dying world. Can we just be blunt and be honest with each other this morning? We are all dying, and unless Christ returns within our generation, we are all going to die. To live in fear of dying or of our loved ones dying doesn't keep us from death. It robs us of life. Jesus didn't tell the apostles they would not die. He couldn't because they would all die. Maybe not on that journey, but what we know is Of the 11 who remained, 10 of them died because of the gospel. 
and one of them endured for the gospel. Jesus didn't tell them that they wouldn't die. He, he, he told them not to fear death. He didn't tell them to be careful to avoid death. He told them to be careful to remember who had given them life. There is such a huge difference in those things. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? <coughs> Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Again, he didn't say they wouldn't die. He said they wouldn't be alone. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Why does trouble make us so uncomfortable when it has been promised to be a part of our lives? Why does somehow trouble triggers that something's wrong when Jesus said, trouble will be with you, but I have defeated trouble. What we want his victory to mean is trouble never comes near. What it really means is trouble can't change what I've planned. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is trouble is in the hands of God. Yeah. He may not be putting it upon us, but just like Job, there is a limit to what it can do to us. And the limit is God's voice in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so if you have recently or are right now enduring trouble, God is in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. He's not doing it to you as punishment. He's walking with you in protection. He's keeping you. And he's even using what was intended for evil for your good. Mm -hmm. But even more than that, for his glory. As Joseph said, that many would be saved. If God spoke to us and said, you're going to go through this, and this many people will be changed by it, most of us would say, okay. Mm -hmm. The problem is, he's already said that in scripture, mm -hmm. so he doesn't need to repeat it every time we face trouble. He wants us to believe his character mm -hmm. and tell it to ourselves. Yeah. So God doesn't come along and say, hey guys, this is about to happen, here's the good. He come, allows trouble to come so that we will bear witness to the scripture and say, he promised trouble, but he said he'd overcome it, and he said good would come from it. I can do this. We don't talk to ourselves enough. We talk about our problems rather than telling ourselves the truth. We get stuck in our church language and our church lingo. Yeah. We get stuck in our wants and our, our, our thoughts about things rather than saying, what does the scripture say about me, about this, about who Christ is? I can promise you this. In this world, you will have trouble. Mm -hmm. But even greater than your trouble is Jesus' victory over it. Mm -hmm which doesn't mean he keeps you out of it. It means he uses it for the opposite purpose that it came. Mm. It came to harm. It will do good. Mm. It came to destroy. It will give life. Mm. It came to shake your faith. It will build your faith. Mm. Even trouble is found in the hands of God. Jesus didn't promise that life would be easy. He promised that their father would be with them. He didn't tell them everything would be okay. He told them that they were of great value to God. Little tangent, can we stop telling each other everything's going to be okay? <laughs> Some things aren't okay, and yet God is still good. Some things aren't okay. They aren't. Some things change our hearts. They change our lives. Some things change what we thought was going to happen. But he's good and he's with us and he will work through it. It's not that it's going to be okay. It's that he is present and he will not let us be destroyed. Last Sunday afternoon as we were eating dinner, the news began to be broadcast about a helicopter crash in Los Angeles. I won't rehash all the misinformation that was spewed over those next hours, but what we now know a week later is that nine people lost their lives, one of them being a very famous athlete, which is the only reason any of us know about it. Kobe, Gianna, John, Carrie, Alyssa, Sarah, Peyton, Christina, and Ara all lost their lives suddenly and tragically. Families were torn apart, lives, even generations were changed. Jesus didn't promise that these things wouldn't happen. In fact, he warned us that they would. Mm. He didn't tell us how to avoid death. He told us how to defeat fear. Yeah. He didn't tell us that if we abide, we won't suffer. Or if we obey, we won't be disappointed. Or if we have enough faith, we will never be heartbroken. He promised us that we were valuable. That we are known intimately. And that when we face death, we will not face it alone. Mm. Someone in these situations always asks, where was God? Whenever there's a tragedy, someone wants to know where was God, Jesus tells us he's there. Yeah. He was present. Yeah. He is in the midst of the tragedy. Yeah. 
It's not his hand that causes death, but it is in his hands, and he holds those who are dying. And it is, in his, ha it is his hands that keep those who must keep on living. I can tell you this, those who were on that hell sparrow falls, he was most certainly present when each one of those souls entered into their eternity. Mm -hmm. What does all of this have to do with abiding? Abiding begins with what we believe about God. Worry and fear are attacks on who God is and what God says. Back to John chapter 6, when Jesus told the crowd not to work for things that perish, but to work for the things that are eternal, he wasn't just talking about food and clothes and houses and such. He was just as much speaking about the emotional and spiritual needs that we try to fill for ourselves rather than trusting in and even waiting for the provision of God. We've all gone too fast, right? Mm -hmm. And realized that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. We've all gone too slow and realized... That was a mistake. I learned years ago, God spoke clearly to my heart, indecision is a decision. Mm -hmm. Trying to put things off until you see what's going to happen is a decision not to do what you know you need to do. Not to do what you know is right. It's one thing to move too quickly and take the wrong job or buy the wrong house, but it's life-changing to build the wrong relationships, mm -hmm. to yeah. choose the wrong spouse, to assume the wrong direction, or to trust the wrong voice. That may be the most life-changing error that many of us are being tempted by day in and day out. Choosing the wrong voice. In Genesis chapter 3, when God came to walk in the garden in the cool of the day after Adam and Eve had sinned, it says that when Adam and Eve heard him that they went and they hid. And so God walked around and then he called out, Adam, where are you? And Adam answered and said, we are hiding because we were naked. And God said, who told you? You were naked. Whose voice have you started to listen to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whose ideas have you given room to? Who's, whose opinion have you decided to believe in in that moment? See, all of their sin was when they listened to the voice of the serpent rather than waiting for the voice of God. Mm -hmm. Or rather than hearkening back to the voice of God. Because there's two things that's already happened. God has already spoken and he's going to speak. And so when we get in the in-between, we have a decision. Do I wait to hear from him or do I go back to what I know I've heard from him? But many times what we do is we listen to the voice that's talking right then and right now. You won't die. Who are you listening to? Where did they end up? They ended up naked. They ended up in sin, but more than anything else, because they were naked before, they just weren't aware of the shame of their nakedness. Mm -hmm. Sin always creates two things, shame and fear. Mm -hmm. And both of those things require us to hide. Mm -hmm. The voice of the enemy, the voice of the world, the voice of our worry, the voice of our anxiety does two things. It makes us hide mm -hmm. because of shame and because of fear. Guys, haven't, haven't we all been in that place? We're ashamed of ourselves, so we pull back from the fellowship we know we're called to be. Mm -hmm. Or we're afraid of being judged, and so we pull back from the places or the people that we know we're supposed to be in. We stop feeling valued. We convince ourselves that we're not going to be valued, that we're not going to be loved, that we're not going to be embraced. In fact, I can tell you as a pastor, when people start to isolate, it's usually because there's some lie that they've started to believe about themselves. And so they go away to figure it out, and the reality is we don't figure those things out away. We were called to be taught those things and to join together in those things. That's why the scripture says, do not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So that, why do we meet together? But encourage one another daily so that the deceitfulness of sin will not harden our hearts. We have this calling to be together because when we're together, the lies and the voices of the lies get exposed for what they really are. They are attacks on who God is. They are attacks on what God does. Yeah. Abiding isn't just when we believe that Jesus is all we need. It's also when we believe that Jesus enjoys giving us what he desires for us. Luke 12, 32 should be imprinted on our hearts. Mm -hmm. It should be something that we take the effort to learn, to memorize, so that we can remind ourselves, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Most of us, we pray like it is our Father's ability yeah. to give us the kingdom, yeah. that it is within His power to give us the kingdom, or it is often His duty to give us the kingdom. But what Luke tells us is, it is God's pleasure, it is God's joy to answer.
answer your prayers, to rescue you from your needs, to sit with you in your grief, to build your joy when you've gone through your sorrow. It is his joy we are never taking from him. He is always giving to us, which is such a profound difference between taking because he has a lot and him giving because he wants us to have everything that we need. If we are the branches and Jesus is the vine, that means that he provides for everything we need. Being a branch is not being poor, needy, destitute, or broken. Being a branch is being confident that we are valued, sure that we are cared for, and dependent upon the one who loves us. We don't depend upon God because we are lacking. We depend upon God because we trust his goodness and we know his abundance. We tend to start with God, to trust Him to save us, to trust Him to forgive us, to trust Him to do the stuff we know we can't do, or to help us when the trouble is more than we know how to handle, but then we have a tendency to go our own way. To go back to old habits, to old behaviors, to old relationships. It's not just you and it's not just me, it is the plight of fallen humanity. We give in to God and then we take back for ourselves. Abraham trusted God's promise to be a great nation. Trust him, trusted him so much that he left his home, he left his country, he left his family, not to go where God told him to go, but to just go. And God said, I will tell you where you're going when you get there. I don't even know how that works, to be real honest with you. There are some times, because you guys married people know the biggest argument that you have is where are we going to eat? <laughs> when you decide that you're not going to cook, you got that much done, but now where are we going to eat? I don't know. What do you want? I don't really care. What do you want? Well, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. What do you want? And then someone makes a suggestion, and the other person says, no, I don't want that. Well, I thought you didn't care what we had. How is it that you know what you don't want? But, and so we have this battle, and so every once in a while, Melissa and I will get in the car and say, let's just start driving, and we'll figure it out. We never do. It just creates bigger arguments. Well, which way should we go? You know, should we go toward Morristown? Should we go towards Hamilton? There's not much in Burlington, so what are we going to do about this problem that we have? God tells Abraham, leave everything and go where I show you when you get there. And he had that much faith. He had enough faith to wander. But then, he didn't have enough faith to believe that God would protect him. He says it after 20 plus years of wandering. He said, from the day God called me to leave, I've, li I've been afraid that someone would kill me for Sarah. Yeah. And so he had enough faith to wander, not enough faith to believe that God would protect him. And somewhere along the line, he got tired of the waiting, he got tired of the believing, and the questions and the worries and the anxiety got in the way, and he took matters into his own hand. You all, we all know the story. He had a child with Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. He believed enough to go, but not enough to abide. Joshua trusted God's leadership enough to cross the Jordan River on dry ground. Trusted God's leadership enough to walk silently around the walls of Jericho for seven days. He trusted God's leadership enough to believe that when we shout and blow the horns, somehow the walls will fall and our enemy will be defeated. He trusted God enough to do, the, to do what made no sense. And God did everything that he had promised. The walls fell, the city was conquered, and Israel began to take possession of the promised land. After the battle, Joshua didn't ask God what he should do next. He did what he thought was best. He took control back from God. He saw a great victory, and rather than settling in with, what, with God, he got excited and rushed ahead of God. He sent the army ahead to the much smaller city of Ai, assuming a fast and total victory, because if we destroy Jericho, Ai will be no problem for us at all. The problem is God had not sent them. God was not fighting for them. Joshua trusted enough to go to war, but not enough to abide, to wait, to hear from God. And Israel's army was defeated at Ai, because they had gone their way, rather than waiting for God's way. Don't ever assume that one victory is a sign of more victory. Mm -hmm. One victory is a sign of what God will do if we will obey. Mm -hmm. If we will abide. Branches stay connected to the vine. That's their only job. They don't grow into vines. They don't graduate into being vine dressers. They don't even get to become fruit. They just stay branches by staying connected. We stay fruitful by staying connected. Abiding is connection, it's relationship, it's belief, trust, and obedience. But what does it look like 
right? Because all those words are biblical words. They're church words. But all we want to know is, yeah, 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 what do I do? <laughs> and so God says, Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. Okay, what do you want me to obey? Which one? But we're like the rich young ruler. Which, which commandment do you want me to obey? If you give me a list, I'll finish the list. But he's saying, no, change your heart. Yeah. Build a relationship. Yeah. Abiding is connection. It's relationship. It's belief. But how do we do it? On the night of Jesus' arrest, he taught the disciples how to abide before he ever told them they needed to abide. During that night, however many hours it was they spent together, he washed their feet and then he told them to do the same to each other. He wasn't telling them to literally wash each other's feet. He was saying, serve each other when it's hard, even when you feel like you're the one who deserves to be served. Hmm. Serve each other even when the ones you're serving don't deserve it, which is why he washed Judas's feet, to give us an example, because when we don't want to serve because someone isn't worthy of it, he says, yeah, that's not one of your options. <laughs> He told them to love each other in the same way that he had loved them. He told them to believe in the things that he had said, and if they couldn't believe the words, please at least believe the things that you've seen me do. Abiding isn't a list of actions, it's a way of living. Mm -hmm. Abiding looks like belief, it looks like trust, it looks like obedience, it looks like patience, it looks like humility. Abiding looks like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus abided in the Father so that he could show us how to abide in him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes abiding is staying where you don't want to stay. And sometimes it's leaving when you would rather stay. Sometimes abiding is embracing someone who has pushed you away. Abiding is always praying for your enemies. It's always giving joy when you've received despair. It's always being what Jesus has been to you, mm -hmm. to those that Jesus has surrounded you with. Mm -hmm. But then again, we have questions, don't we? It's okay for us to have questions. The apostles were filled with them. After all that they had seen and all that they had heard, after all the time they had spent with Jesus, when the night of his arrest came, when all of the preparation had been done and their lives were tested, they asked for just a little bit more. And so there in John 14, as it begins, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. For I go to prepare a place for you. And, and then he goes on to tell them that they will come also because they know the way. And Thomas stops him and says, How do we know the way? Or how can we know where you're going? And how can we know the way? Thomas says, Just a little more information. Mm -hmm. Isn't... I've, I've prayed that a whole, a lot of times. Can you just show me? Just show me a little more. Can you just give me a little more so that I can, give me something more to go on. Jesus responded and says, Thomas, I am the way mm. and the truth and the life. You don't need directions. You've already got a relationship. Yeah. His answer was abide. Just stay with me. Philip then asked not for more information, but for another experience. He needed just one more sign. Show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Haven't you always ever needed one more sign? God, just, Lord, I know what you've been speaking to my heart, but if you could just have somebody else confirm it, if you could just have somebody come along, if, if something could just happen, God, that let me know that this is what you want from me and this is what you want for me. We are there in Philip's shoes. Just, just show us one more thing. And that will be enough. Can I be real honest? One more thing's never enough. One more thing leads to one more thing. One more sign leads to one more sign. And so Jesus responded, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? See, this is a hard thing for many of us. God does not respond to our demands for more signs. He simply reminds us of what we've already seen. And he calls us to believe what he has already done in our lives. I think that's our greatest challenge. We think we should start with dependence, but then grow out of it. Grow into something more dignified, something that's more comfortable for us. We don't want daily bread. We want a pantry filled with provisions. Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't that like, mm -hmm. like it's not much faith. We, we, in, in our faith-driven, our, our, our prosperity-driven gospel that we are surrounded with, it's not enough faith to ask for today's bread. Right? Have more faith. Ask for a refrigerator full. Ask for a pantry full. And the reality is when Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he wants us to depend upon him. Mm -hmm. And if you've never studied the Lord's Prayer, daily bread doesn't mean your meals. It means everything that is necessary for life. Mm -hmm. And so what Jesus is praying, is teaching us to pray is not for abundance, but for the reality that we'll always have enough. 
to teach us to pray for the, to, to live like the window, the widow did when Elijah came into her house. That him coming there didn't mean that she had more than she'd ever need. It meant that she would always have what she needed. And isn't that what he's already promised us? He hasn't promised us that we will never wonder if we'll have enough. He's promised us that he will always provide for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Tr trust God. Believe that what I need today, he will give to me today. That he is both provider and provision. And so whatever you happen to need today, don't ask to get out of it. Ask for him to be present in it. Because he already is. You don't need grief to go away. You need comfort today. Mm -hmm. You don't need joy that somehow makes your sorrows go away. You need joy in the midst of your sorrows. You don't need hope that makes you never fear. You need hope while you are afraid. That's what abiding is. It's this place, not of getting everything we need, but knowing the one who has and will give what we need as we need it. What we must learn is what Andrew Murray wrote. Dependence is our intended relationship. Mm. God created us to depend upon him forever. He created us to be branches so that he could be our vine. He created us not just to need him, but to see his great value and to desire him. To see his great love and to trust him. To see his great faithfulness and submit every part of our lives to him. If we were created to be dependent upon God, then nothing other than dependence upon God will ever bring us joy or peace or satisfaction. God created us for a specific relationship with Him. And because He's the Creator, He sets the terms of the relationship. Right? I don't get to say to God, how about this? <clears throat> Again, parents... We set the terms, or we're supposed to anyway. We set the terms. I remember when Noah was little, I would tell him, we're going to do this, and he would ask me, he would say, how about this deal? How about, Noah, here's what our day looks like. How about, instead of your plan, we incorporate your plan, but I get my way? A lot of my prayers have seemed to sound that way. God, I know what you want to do in my life, but here's what I'd like you to do. How about we find a way to get my will mixed with yours so we can both be satisfied? <laughs> and yet the reality that we seem to not understand is anything outside of the intended purpose can't satisfy. No matter how much we think we need it, no matter how much we want it, I want to tell you this today, and I pray this often. We, we need to thank God for everything he's provided. But we also need to remind ourselves, if it haven't, hasn't been provided, it's because God knew we didn't need it. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you something today that may be hard for you to swallow because it's hard for me to swallow. What you don't have, you don't need. Mm -hmm. Stop pleading with God like there's something missing. Mm -hmm. And start learning you have everything you need. doesn't mean you won't ever get more. It means you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Because if you did, he would have already given it. Mm -hmm. Because he is a good father. And he is a faithful provider. Ultimately, in all of this, we want the terms to change to make more sense to us so that we can have what we want, but also have the assurance that we're where God wants us. Ultimately, I think that's what happened to the rich young ruler. He wanted to have eternal life. He just also wanted to have his wealth. It's what happened with Simon the sorcerer. He wanted to have his sins forgiven, but he also wanted to keep the powers that he had before he believed in Jesus. And it's what sometimes happens to you and to me. We want to walk with God, but we also want to have times when we get to lead the way. We want his promises, we just want them on our timetable. We want him to use us, we just want to be used in the way that makes sense to us, or best uses the gifts that we believe should be used. We want God to be patient with us. We just would rather he not Make us be patient with him. See, it's not at all that we're just branches. It's that branches are what we were meant to be. And life becomes filled with anxiety, fear, stress, and turmoil when we're trying to be more or less than we were meant to be. Forgive me, but there are some of us here that love the Lord and have been saved, but our hearts are upside down and our lives are a mess because we've gone our own way. We've made our own decisions. We've held on to people and things that God said to let go of. Or we've let go of people and things because it was too hard or seemed to be taking too long. We don't have the faculties to be independent. We don't have the wherewithal to process our own sorrow or create and sustain our own joy. We cannot be satisfied by anything other than a complete trust in Jesus. Today is a day to decide if we'll keep leading or start following. 
A day to decide if we'll continue to push for our way or if we'll let God have His way. It's a day to decide if we will do what we want or if we will want what God chooses to do. It is a day where we decide if we will continue to argue for our desires or if we will decide to abide. So ultimately, the question that we started with is the question we believe what we've heard Jesus say. Serve others the way Jesus has served you. Love others the way Jesus has loved you. Forgive others in the same manner that God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. Abiding isn't how we get more from God. It's when we become what God has already done and given to us. It's not just being a branch. It's when being a branch is all we want to be. It's not what we do. It's who we are. And will we be those who abide? Will we be those who stop controlling, who stop ordering, who stop leading our lives and start following Jesus? The beginning of abiding is giving up. And so I ask you today as we close, are you ready to surrender control of your life and put everything in you, everything about you, everything you're waiting for in the hands of God? Because here's the hard truth. We can't abide until we surrender. Mm -hmm. And so until he has all of us, we can't rest in all of him. And so we go back to Psalm 139 as we close with prayer today. Search me and know my heart. Show me the places in my heart that I'm still in control of. Show me the places in my heart where I'm still afraid you're going to let me down, you're going to disappoint, and you're not going to come through. Show me the places in my heart where I am protecting myself just in case your will isn't what I wanted it to be. Show me the places in my heart where I'm still angry over what you didn't do. Show me the places in my heart that haven't been given over. Because I can't settle in until I've handed over. And so the question that we close with today is not how do we abide. It is will we surrender? Will we let go? Will we put it all in his hands so that we can finally have a firm connection to the vine? Mm -hmm. Would you bow your heads with me today?